What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here and I'm pretty damn excited, not because we're gonna talk about overclocking 4970K CPU 780s, three-way monitors and all that crap on this channel, but that's because this channel is about to cross 100,000 subscribers. 100,000 PC elitists like me who think that PC gaming and PC tinkering and overclocking is just a whole lot of fun. So with that, I wanna go ahead and start this video by saying thank you each and every one of you for making this channel what it is today. Because without you guys, this channel would be absolutely nothing but a very dark cobweb filled cricket chirping room, which it, it actually is anyway, but you guys make it all that much better. Well guys, I have spent the last three days putting together an overclocking review for you guys here regarding the 4790K. Now before we get started, we need to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. And no, I'm not talking about Barnacles. He already went home to Seattle. Now I'm just kidding guys, Jerry is actually a very good friend of mine, but if you want to poke a little fun, go ahead and head over to Twitter and say, hey Jerry, Jay said you're an elephant. And let's just see what he says and how long it takes him to figure it out. That should be fun. There's a benchmark for you. All right, all right, well, we'll go ahead and get back on topic here. The elephant in the room for me is actually, why did I upgrade from a 3770K to a 4790K? I mean, really, the upgrade was gonna be minimal and marginal at best, and to many, it might seem like a downright waste of money. And with that said, I think a lot of you might be 100% accurate when you say that. But remember, guys, I do this because I wanna bring you a first-hand experience review. I don't wanna just talk about things I've read on the internet or other first-hand experiences. I want to experience it myself so I can give you what my two cents are. You see, see what I did there? Do you, do you see what I did? I wanna give you my two cents on how I feel about this processor so that I can speak with first-hand unbiased experience. Now the setup I'm using for this, obviously Project Skunk Works right here is a pretty big deal. If you guys wanna learn more about that system, go ahead and click right here and it will take you over to the build vlogs that I did. Uh, I actually have more than an hour worth of vlog footage of me putting that together. You might find it interesting, but if you don't care about any of that and you just wanna to get to the meat and to the numbers, well then go ahead and stick around and listen to what I have to say. Now the 4790K does bring some improvements over the 4770K, but remember guys, the architecture and the platform of the die and the chip itself is exactly the same as the 4770K. So the very first disappointing statement I need to tell you guys is that it's not a whole lot better in terms of overclocking and stability when it comes to the 4770K. Where Intel made its improvements is in the thermal capabilities of the chip by improving the TIM or the thermal interface material between the integrated heat spreader and the die. And they also beefed up the capacitors and the transistors on the chip itself to give a more stable power delivery. Now remember guys, codename Haswell is a brand new architecture for Intel. They've never done anything like this. And they moved the memory controller off the motherboard and onto the chip. So there is a whole lot going on inside of there which is why the 4790K was a refresh that I think Intel really needed to bring to market. Now the 4790K is a pretty decent overclocker. In fact, I was able to achieve over 4.9 gigahertz stable when it comes to A to 64 running for an hour. But the problem was I wasn't able to get there by overclocking strictly on the multiplier. In fact, the only way I was able to get to 4.9 stable is by using a multiplier of 47 and adjusting the B clock frequency to get me up over that 4.9 gigahertz threshold. Now, ADA 64 benchmarks were very, very stable. In fact, they were able to run for an hour with absolutely no problems whatsoever. But I backed it off a little bit to 4.8 because I started noticing that I was getting some slight uh, memory controller issues with the overclock, so I backed it off again to a 47 multiplier and a 102.5 B clock ratio. Now, why do I keep adjusting the B clock? Well, the base clock or the 100 megahertz base clock that everything is calculated on when it comes to the overclocking or the speed of the CPU, even stock speeds are based off of that. My chip would not overclock using a 48 multiplier whatsoever. My chip just completely crapped out. So 47 multiplier was the best that I could do. Now the problem you often encounter when you start overclocking using the base clock is that you overclock more than just the CPU. The CPU multiplier only affects the effective speed or frequency of the CPU, but the base clock affects everything. The CPU, the memory controller, even the PCI Express lanes. So once you start doing that, you start messing with the way your PCI Express graphics cards work 
and you start to mess up those overclocks if those are overclocked as well. Now, even though I had a very stable 4.9 and even back that base clock down to 4.816 gigahertz to see if I could gain more stability in my PCI Express lanes, I started to encounter very, very finicky, wonky, just downright gremlin type behavior from my SLI setup here with my 780s. My overclocks went completely unstable. Overclocks on my graphics cards that have been stable for over six months just went completely trashed. They just didn't work anymore. So base clock overclocking just became no longer an option for me. Now, when it comes to max temperatures on the cores, I did have a max temp during ADA 64 maximum stress and heat test of an 80, 83, 84, and 81 on the cores. Now, before you guys say, whoa, shit, this system in behind me is running in the 80s on the cores, you guys have to remember what ADA64 is designed to do. It's designed to take floating point units, CPU calculations, and the cache, and just stress them as high as they possibly can during the stress test. In fact, it's designed to pump as much heat into your CPU as possible. So it's full load and full heat testing. In fact, when it came to the test, it was actually floating around in the low 70s, high 60s, and when you take the FPU out of it, it actually was running in the high 40s and the low 50s. So temperatures on this were fantastic. While gaming and doing all of my gaming benchmarking on this system, things never left the 40s when it came to the CPU temperature. So that is actually very impressive considering it was running at 1.3 volts. 1.3 volts on a 4770K with water was still getting pretty damn hot for many people's CPUs. Now, one of the things I did to see if I was getting any real world performance increase when it came to 3770K versus 4790K is I went ahead and rendered that part four of Project Skunk Works, which was nearly 30 minutes of a video and vlog of MP4 and or MOV to MP4 and overlays and sound and transitions. And my 3770K took about 55 minutes to render that at 1080p H.264 encoder. Now, when I did the exact same video render with the 4790K, it did it in 36 minutes. Memory speeds were actually exactly the same. I'm running them at 2000 megahertz on the RAM. So I would say that there was definitely an improvement there. In fact, that's gonna save me a hell of a lot of time bringing you guys videos over the course of owning this CPU. Now, when it comes to gaming, can you guys expect any sort of improvement? Likelihood, the chances are no. In fact, my Valley Benchmark scores remained pretty much exactly the same. But when it came to 3D Mark 11, I actually got a little bit of an improvement. In fact, my score is a 22,079 compared to 21,000 and some change of the 3770K. Now, one of the reasons for that is the way 3D Mark 11 works its uh, CPU calculations and its CPU speed is it puts all of the physics rendering onto the CPU. So my score rose directly because of the physics rendering on the CPU of the 4790K versus the 3770. Now, if you guys take anything from this video whatsoever, take it as this. If you guys are gamers and you're on a 2600K, a 2700K, 3770, 4770, this is not worth an upgrade for you. It's not, it's still gonna run you over $300 in most places. And even if you live near a micro center, it's still gonna cost you 300 with tax you're really not gonna see much improvement. In fact, I don't recommend putting 4790Ks in a Z87 board because my experiences with that were a lot of the Z87 BIOS are not really up to par with this. Some companies may be better than others right now, but my situation with that was really, really poor. In fact, I was not happy with it whatsoever. I was very upset with the performance. In fact, I scrapped an entire video that I was trying to do to see if it was even worth it. In fact, it probably would've made a good rage video, but I digress. Now, another thing I'm asked quite often is, Jay, I have an i5 blah, blah, blah. And the reason why I say blah, 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 I don't even care what the numbers are after that, is you're now comparing an i5 to an i7. The 4790K is gonna blow away any i5 that you throw at it. So if you have a motherboard that is capable of running a Devil's Canyon 4790K CPU, then by all means, go for it. Now, I can't tell you guys whether or not it's gonna be worth it to wait another year for the Broadwell CPU. We know nothing about it, or at least I know nothing about it. And for all we know, the Z97 motherboard may not even be fully compatible with a lot of the features that Broadwell may bring to the table. So if you buy a Z97 motherboard now, it may be similar to those who bought a Z87 last year. Going with a uh, Devil's Canyon CPU now is actually giving some Z87 owners a lot of headache. So who knows what the future is gonna bring? My idea on this is it's never really worth it to wait unless you're right on the edge of when we know things tend to release. 
And that tends to be in June for CPU stuff because of Computex. That's when Intel likes to debut their stuff. And usually either the spring or the holiday season for GPUs. That's pretty much the way I look at things. So guys, this has been my take on the 4790K underwater. It's a fantastic CPU that's actually gonna serve me very well. And considering I have an L3 revision, which a lot of people have said don't overclock nearly as well as the newer L4, I'm actually pretty excited with this. I may try and get my hands on an L4 just to see if it actually makes any difference and plop it into the Z97M power uh, setup over there. I have right over there. I'm now being texted because I'm popular. No, the hookers and blow can wait until tomorrow. Send. Crap, this thing was on. You guys have some questions about 4790K? I advise you to take it over to Twitter. The comment section of YouTube is just, I don't, it hurts my head. So if you guys want to ask me a question, bring it to Twitter. I'll do the best I can to answer you. You can also email me or head on over to Facebook. I'm reachable on all of those platforms. And I do the best I can to get to you guys. I get hundreds of messages a week, and I'm just one guy. I'm one guy with multiple personalities, but I'm still just one guy. You know what I'm saying? All right, guys, it's time to get out of here. Things are getting a little bit weird. And of course, see you guys in the next one.